Hey, this is Silas again from Rentaton. I'm just here on the High Line in New York. It's one of the, it's 90 degrees today, so it's one of the first 90 degrees days I think of this year, uh, coming out of the winter. This earlier, okay, when I got up earlier today, I saw this this news story of um, of a car of a car hitting some people in Times Square. So that's just a few blocks. It's like 50 minute walk from where I'm at from where I live so I just been scouting the area for some work a few days ago and I was just thinking like I could have been out there scouting at this time but I was talking to some friends about it and some of them were just telling me stories about how they how they were at work and people at work were telling them oh I wish it's I hope it's not a Muslim they I mean they just found out they said it's a drunk driver but still news is coming up but anyway they said okay I wish it's not Muslim they can I mean uh, it's frustrating stuff. Like they said, I wish it wasn't a Muslim because the Muslim community doesn't need that right now. And I'm thinking, what kind of life do you live where you're just in your cush place, some people just got hit by a car, you somehow are thinking about this other group. And I'm thinking, when I hear that, I think it could be an accident, but if it's intentional, it's likely a Muslim. And then I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking, is this... What, what's the point of that? What's the point of that realization? Does, it, does that get people to actually understand where the actual problem is coming from? That's, in my opinion, statecraft. Like, they're going to focus on the Muslims, but they're not going to focus on why that small percentage of Muslims are deciding to behave in the way that they do in their attacks and things like that. And that's from state involvement. That's from from wars, that's from state-controlled immigration, which is not... Okay. And then it just sets up this whole, this whole atmosphere of there being a war, there being a battle going on. And I made this one video, Dear White Genocide, about how there is no white genocide, talking about this, that uh, Netflix video. And speaking of Netflix, I was like, yeah, it's not, that's not a good enough reason to cancel Netflix, because that Dear White People thing is probably pretty tame. I haven't actually watched it, but I watched it, heard some reviews, and it's probably pretty tame. And as I said in that video, I don't think what's going on in the West, particularly in America, is a white genocide or anything that was in that video. But one thing that might actually be a genocide of sorts, not of sorts, an actual full-on genocide is... This thing, I just listened to this presentation of Stefan Molyneux and somebody else on on what's happening in South Africa. And I remember being in Kenya a few years ago and having some of my friends that had lived in South Africa, studied in South Africa, and they were talking about how there's some political things going on. I think it was something with the switch in um, presidency or if Zuma didn't win or something like that. They said there was a good chance that there was actually going to be battles, there was actually going to be an actual wars. And after listening to this presentation and the little that I knew about what's going on in South Africa, like, just this one line that's sticking with me, more people are murdered in a week than, exist, than were murdered over the 40 years in detention during apartheid, the worst of the worst of the times. And this video goes into the history of South Africa. You really got to watch this video and share this video and actually be aware of this stuff. And the most disturbing part about me, it's like nightmare fuel stuff. It's not the actual material. I've been just marathoning this show on uh, Netflix called uh, The 100 about just the world kind of ending and seeing what happens with it. And some horrific things happen in that, but I feel like desensitized. I know there's some stuff like if I see somebody's leg getting broken, you know, you get the empathic feeling about it, but people are making really tough decisions for their people. You know, there's these different tribes. They're all humans. They do a good job of getting the demographics of people mixed together, but they, they, these tribes of people are divided by their, their reality tunnels, the way they live. Some people live in one location, some people are living in space, some people are living in these other places. So that unites these people together, and there's, there's that aspect that I think we've lost. I'm going to tie this in with one, one friend of mine that, well not a friend, was somebody in a Facebook group was telling me about how they knew an African that, he tells me this was a pygmy and he was from the pygmy tribe, half pygmy and half something else, some other tribe but in Angola and he lived out in the woods wearing a loincloth until he was about, um, the guy said until he was about in his teens and then he moved to the city and now he's I think in Portugal or something, but anyway, he 
this guy said he was one of the most well-adjusted Africans he'd ever met. And I thought, why is he well-adjusted? It's probably because by living out in the woods, you're stripped from all... You're stripped down, it's stripped down to the reality of life, to the environmentally... To the environmental environment that... I mean, sorry, to environmental environment. To the evolutionary environment that we all developed in. And all this... Like... <laughs> You get you can lose that when you live in a place in a city like this. People are just relaxed, sitting around, and you can see people just kind of laying around in the grass. And you see this a lot in Kenya. I don't know. I might share some videos and post that in here, but in the parks also, you see people just kind of laying around. This is the certain common common behavior that humans have that can be They can be forgotten, or you think you're living in a different kind of environment when you have all these trappings around you, all this technology and all this civilization. But I propose that this pygmy that my acquaintance had mentioned was well adjusted because he could see through all this facade. And I think from traveling around, I've been able to try and kind of crack through that and see through some of these things because. How much different is this? How much different is this world than just living out in the woods? And you know, you walk around and you see people seem to be entirely too comfortable, but how how dangerous is it still? Okay, I'm rambling a bit, but let me let me come back to the South Africa thing. The thing that bothered me the most was the fact that this is going on and people are focused on People focused on small trivialities in life, and yet they could actually be a full-on genocide coming soon in a place like South Africa. This information is out there. Most people ignore it. The majority of people are just unaware of it. But then there's a small cadre of people that are actually taking their time to obfuscate and make sure nobody knows about this information. And that's that's just really disturbing. And that's how it goes at the same way you know we see this argument when a terror attack happens people come into defense and say oh no it's just a small group of people who do this but you see the amount of terror and damage they cause what we don't talk about enough is the small group of people on the other end of things who perpetuate the environment where this danger occurs because it's not the thousands of people up here. I mean, they may have their own issues. I have my own issues. We have our own things that we're dealing with on a personal basis. But these people up here have the right to be just comfortable walking around, taking their time. I can just sit here and record this video and post it without anyone bothering me or talking to me. And that's, I think that's something we have to take advantage of. We have to understand that, yes, Small amounts of people can do really horrible things, but small amounts of people also can do really positive things. I'm going to close off with just this one line that I thought of, just not that I thought of, that I heard. When you think of classical music, about five or six composers make, about, make up about 90% or no, about over 75% of what we consider to be the classical music field. And in that sense, it's just showing that I think the Pareto principle, also the 80-20, where 20% of your work get, gets 100% of your results. But just going back to that thing, just think about this. How few people can cause something really harmful? And also how few people it takes to actually stop that harmful thing. So if you have certain information, if you have the ability to share ideas, and even repeating other people's ideas, if something is good and considered valuable, Take some time, repeat it. That's what I'm doing here. This video, it's just a bunch of different thoughts that, and ideas that I've heard from people, and I'm just repeating it. There's a chance that by me making this video, somebody else will hear it, and it will be in a language or in a mode that they can understand or take in and pass that message on, and I think that's worth it. And what's it costing you? You could just sit and do this when you're like making some food or doing something. I think more people need to get out there and start sharing their ideas and sharing their thoughts and that's how I think that's how we get to better better world. That's how we get to keep the good things that we've got. Okay, well that's it for now. It was a bit of a ramble of a video but just wanted to share those thoughts and put this video out there so links are gonna be in the low bar. Like, share and subscribe. More coming soon. Thanks. Bye.